Um, want to welcome you to our session today uh, titled Unlocking uh, Highly Regulated Enterprise Workloads with Software as a Service on AWS GovCloud US. I think that may be the longest title for a session here at reInvent this year. Um, my name is Keith Brooks. I am Senior Manager and Head of Business Development for our AWS GovCloud US regions and our GovCloud business. Uh, and I'm joined here by my colleagues, David Cruley uh, and Joe Arthur from AWS Technology Partner N4. And we're going to spend some time this morning talking specifically about SaaS and more importantly, SaaS and GovCloud and what that unlocks for customers, but then more importantly, as a SaaS vendor, how to think about approaching it from a compliance perspective, an architecture perspective, uh, and a go-to-market perspective so that you can sell your capabilities, your products, your services to your customers that are in more regulated industries. And we chose this topic for a few reasons, but the primary reason is over the last 18, well, I would say 18 to 36 months, uh, me and my team and Dave and his team and some other teams within AWS um, have spent a pretty considerable amount of time working with customers and partners um, that are either public sector or private sector, but are looking to increasingly bring more regulated and highly compliant workloads to, to the cloud, and in our case, AWS. Uh, and specifically in my case and Dave's case, uh, to the GovCloud region, now regions. And as we work with those customers uh, and partners, we, we really kind of uncovered a few things. One, we learned that customers were increasingly looking to use software as a service uh, and other variants of as a service uh, capabilities, whether it's platform as a service um, and, and other capabilities. We also saw that many SaaS vendors were laser focused on serving those markets and serving those industries. And it just so happens that we also see in the industry analysts and some other entities corroborating what we saw. This particular chart um, is from the Cisco Global Cloud Index and it has some interesting stats on it. I won't spend too much time uh, on the chart itself, but that middle stat, 74% of public cloud workloads will be software as a service by the year 2020 directly relating to over $236 billion of revenue, which not only underscores the fact that organizations are starting to use software as a service, um, but there's tremendous opportunity for the technology vendors and SaaS vendors to go after that market and serve those customers as well. Now, with, with GovCloud, a lot of the conversations we have with customers and with SaaS vendors really focus on what are the implications to software as a service when you're, when you're really targeting customers either in private industry or public sector entities that are in regulated industries, government regulated industries. And for the sake of GovCloud, when we say highly regulated industries, we're really talking about public sector entities, government agencies, specifically in the US, um, at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, but we're also talking about private industry and specifically Organizations and firms in industries like aerospace and defense, energy, uh, financial services, law enforcement, public safety and public justice, uh, healthcare, and even other organizations and industries such as manufacturing uh, and shipbuilding. And as we talk to those organizations and the SaaS providers, we, we tend to hear a few things that, that come out as themes. One, the customers care a lot about data security and how SaaS companies and SaaS vendors and their products secure their data when they're using their products, specifically in the cloud. With GovCloud, our customers are also laser focused on compliance. So usually it's data security and how does a SaaS vendor and their product address their regulatory requirements and their compliance requirements so that they're not only secure, but they can prove to their auditors and their security organizations uh, and even their government regulators that as they're using software as a service, they're doing so in a way that's compliant with, with their responsibilities and obligations. They also want solutions that are highly available, highly resilient, fault tolerant. They want software as a service that also integrates across their portfolio, both internally with their organizations, but also with their partners and other organizations that those SaaS products and, and solutions may be integrating with. So for example, um, if it's a public sector entity, take a federal government agency for example, and they're sharing information and data with other partners and other departments and agencies, they wanna ensure that those SaaS solutions still check the box in terms of security, compliance, and governance as they share sensitive data with their, with their organizations. And in private industry, we see more and more use cases where customers are using GovCloud, using SaaS solutions in the region, and integrating and working with supply chain vendors and other 
entities in their ecosystem that have the same requirements they have to meet as well. We also see uh, situations where customers want simplified licensing, simplified procurement, and hopefully simplified operations of those SaaS capabilities uh, when they're using them in the cloud. And it just so happens that those qualities and characteristics really do align pretty well to why we built and launched GovCloud uh, originally back in 2011. And GovCloud today is actually comprised of two regions, right? It's the original region that we built and launched in August of 2011 um, that's now called AWS GovCloud US West. And then recently we launched a second GovCloud region in the US, which is called AWS GovCloud US East. So think of them collectively as AWS GovCloud US. But more importantly, as we looked at those type of characteristics that we hear from our customers, and increasingly that SaaS companies have to address when they sell their solutions to these organizations, um, there's a nice dovetail into why building SaaS on GovCloud helps software as a service and platform as a service vendors better serve their constituents, their customers, uh, and hopefully get those capabilities in the hands of those organizations. One, for GovCloud. Isolated, secure, highly compliant set of AWS infrastructure and a set of services so that customers and organizations can use those capabilities in a compliant manner. In tandem to that, the way we built and operate the regions, uh, both from a, a technical perspective and a compliance perspective, gives our customers the ability to run highly sensitive, highly regulated uh, information and data in the regions. Um, specifically, uh, with the government, there, there's, a, there's a term called a, uh, controlled unclassified information, or CUI, which I'll talk about here in a second. But because of the way we've built and operated GovCloud, it really gives our customers, whether it's public sector or private industry, the ability to run those sensitive workloads, including CUI, uh, in the cloud. And it's really the combination of sensitive data, the way we built and operate the region, that also lends to private and public sector organizations running highly mission critical or business critical capabilities in the cloud. Now, when you take those three things, um, we've been at this for a while at AWS. Uh, in the last 18 to 24 months, we've made significant investments to build tools, utilities, resources, and capabilities to also speed time to compliance, both for our customers, end customers, uh, and our partners. And as part of those tools and resources, we've also invested in an ecosystem of AWS partners that also have utilities can help speed time to compliance, because we want to ensure that as a software as a service company, you can quickly get to market and quickly get your products in the hands of your customers, but at the same time, we want to speed those customers' ability to use your products to address their mission and business needs. So for software as a service providers, think of GovCloud as a set of regions, a set of services, and a set of utilities that give you the benefits of the AWS cloud with the capabilities to address highly regulated and highly sensitive workloads. Now, when it comes to GovCloud, we really focus on a number of very specific regulations and compliance regimes. When we first launched the region in 2011, um, the, the kind of foundational compliance requirement was ITAR, or International Traffic and Arms Regulations, which is a U.S. government regulation that deals with import and export control of defense and military-related data and information. We fast-followed with focusing on additional gov U.S. government-oriented regimes like FedRAMP. How many of you guys in the, in the audience have heard of FedRAMP? It's pretty good. Um, FedRAMP, for those of you that didn't raise your hand, is the U.S. government's security and compliance framework that deals with addressing FISMA requirements in the cloud. Similar to FedRAMP, the U.S. Department of Defense has their version of a compliance framework for hosting sensitive data in the cloud, and that's called the DOD SRG, or Security Requirements Guide. Those are kind of the three foundational compliance regimes that a lot of our customers in GovCloud uh, focus on. But beyond those three, we also give capabilities around CEGIS. If you're a law enforcement or public safety or public justice uh, entity and you have those requirements from the Department of Justice, you can address CEGIS requirements. Um, IRS 1075, if you're dealing with sensitive tax and financial information. Uh, FIPS, if you're dealing with government customers or customers in regulated industries that have that cryptographic standard as well. Um, and NIST, so if you're dealing with broader sets, whether it's NIST 853 or 871 if you're a contractor, we give you the ability to address that broad set of compliance regimes with GovCloud. So as a software as a service vendor, you can leverage those capabilities that are purpose built on our platform uh, and build those capabilities into your software solutions. Now I mentioned controlled and classified information a few seconds ago. And what we see is because of these compliance regimes, 
we increasingly have organizations both in public sector and private industry that are running workloads that deal with CUI. And, and CUI is really how the U.S. government uh, classifies unclassified data that is highly sensitive, right? So it's 20 categories of data categorizations, and they span from things like critical infrastructure, um, export control, privacy, financial information, uh, law enforcement information. But think of these data categories as sets of information and data that the U.S. government, while unclassified, deems to be highly sensitive. So there's additional handling caveats and safeguards around that data. And what we see is because of the compliance we offer in GovCloud, more and more of our customers, both in industry and in government, are running these CUI workloads in the region. So for software as a service vendors and providers, it's really giving your regulated industry customers the ability to address these type of data categories um, so that they can use your solutions in a compliant manner. And it's not just the traditional software companies uh, in the traditional markets that are doing it as well. Um, we have a wide range of software as a service vendors that have built on top of, of GovCloud um, and they're selling their capabilities to their customers, whether private industry or public sector, um, that require that higher bar to meet in terms of regulations, compliance, and security. Um, and that's what we're here to talk about today, right? So we're going to talk about not just the business aspects and the opportunities, but as a software as a service vendor, how do you approach it from a technical perspective? How do you approach it from an operational perspective and a compliance perspective so that you can build and go to market with your solutions to sell to these customers uh, in these regulated industries? So with that, um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dave Curley. Um, he's going to introduce himself. But after Dave talks specifically about architecting SaaS for highly regulated workloads in GovCloud, we're going to have Joe from Infor come up and talk specifically about how Infor took that same approach to build not just one, but a portfolio of capabilities uh, in GovCloud to address their mission critical customers. So Dave, over to you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. And uh, morning, everybody. Um, again, again, my name is Dave Cruley, and I manage the solution architecture team for the GovCloud region. And what my team's mission in life is to do is to help customers onboard and operate within the GovCloud region. I mean, in terms of operational uh, aspects, GovCloud is an Amazon region just like all the other ones. So largely you operate the same in the region, but as you know, Keith alluded to earlier, a lot of earlier, a lot of the customers that operate in GovCloud are laser focused on security and compliance. So there are nuances uh, to operating in GovCloud and meeting those security and compliance bars. So that's a lot of what my team op, uh, engages in are a lot of conversations around security, compliance, and networking. And for the next 15 or 20 minutes here, I'm going to focus a lot on the compliance aspect of that. So. Again, as Keith said, you know, compliance is a primary driver for a lot of customers to come into GovCloud. Uh, you know, if you have specific compliance requirements, uh, Keith mentioned that there was the, he had the slide up just a minute ago that had a laundry list of various security accreditation or compliance accreditations that you could get within GovCloud. The the ones across the top of the screen, uh, FedRAMP High, DoD SRG Impact Level Four and Five. Um, ITAR and CGIS are the, the big four that you can uniquely can only get within GovCloud. So, so customers seeking to comply with those compliance requirements, they end up in our GovCloud region. So then that always that sometimes leads to the question of, okay, so if I just build on top of that, build on top of your infrastructure, you're certified, you're accredited, I'm good to go, right? And um, well, I wish that was the case. It's it's really not. So um, there is, you know, there are, there are aspects to operating in this environment. We do a lot of heavy lifting for you to, to make it so that it is easier for you to comply, but there is work on your side that you have to do in order to comply with ITAR, CGIS, DOD, SRG, FedRAMP High, those kinds of things. So the way that we operate, and those of you guys who are familiar with uh, AWS previously have probably seen this slide before. We operate on a shared responsibility model, and it really probably wouldn't be an Amazon presentation if we didn't put one of these up here at this point. So you can check that off the list. It's there. So, um, but uh, you know, kind of the way we operate is, is that we secure the infrastructure. So the, 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 the way this slide here is configured is um, think of infrastructure as a service. You're launching uh, EC2 instances. You're launching virtual servers. You're gonna, you, you know, and you're going to run your infrastructure on top of those. So we're going to take care of from basically the hypervisor down. We're going to take care of that for you. And then anything you launch on top of that from the guest operating system on up, so if you launch it as a Windows server or a Red Hat server, 
the care and feeding of that server is your responsibility. So you've got the, you know, for patching the server, doing maintenance on the server. Um, uh, actually, went forward on me there. Sorry about that. So main, uh, patching the server, uh, maintaining your application on that server, doing encryption of the data at rest and in transit coming to and from that machine is all up to you. So you, so you own that part of the equation. And then obviously if you use more of our platform centric service, so think like RDS, Redshift, Dynamo, we're going to move up the stack and do more for you. We're going to manage more of that on your behalf, but you still then have, do you want the data encrypted? Do you own the access control to that? You know, that sort of thing. And if you move all the way up to something like S3 where you're just, you know, you're reading data and writing data, you still have control over how you want that data encrypted, what access controls you want, you want placed upon that. So depending on the kind of server or service that you're using from AWS, you know, we, you may, we may move up the stack and cover more of that for you, but you still have responsibilities. So what are those more specifically? So what I did here was I took the FedRAMP control families, and if it's, if FedRAMP isn't, uh, isn't what you're complying with, if it's DOD, SRG, or CGIS, they map pretty closely to this. CGIS has the control set will map pretty cleanly into FedRAMP, and the DOD, SRG requirements are also based on the same NIST 853 control set. So either way, um, you know, the, you're pretty much covered across the board here. So what we're gonna, as, as you might expect, what you'll see being covered from us is the physical environment. You know, we have control that we have access that you don't. So we're obviously gonna, we're, you're gonna inherit that from us. And things like um, uh, contingency planning, uh, media protection, those kinds of things, we're gonna, we're gonna cover that at the infrastructure level. Um, then, why is it doing that? Um, so then above that line of, in the shared responsibility model, what you'll find is you'll find two kinds of controls there. You'll find some that are uh, shared responsibility controls or hybrid controls where we're gonna do part of it and you're gonna do part of it. And then there are other ones that are completely customer, uh, they're completely the customer's responsibility. So an example of a shared control would be something like access control. We're gonna, um, we're gonna describe, implement and describe very clearly in our, in our compliance documentation what we do to manage access control for, for the infrastructure layer. So when people are in administering the servers, doing maintenance, doing troubleshooting, that sort of thing, we're gonna, we're gonna define very clearly what our access control policies are. That being said, once you launch your application on top of that, you're then going to have to, um, you're then going to have to document how you're controlling app, uh, operating system level access, application level access, that sort of thing. Similarly with configuration management, we have configuration management policies to ensure that we update our infrastructure in a secure and orderly manner. You're gonna have to do the same thing at the application level. You're gonna have to describe that. So you're gonna see a lot of those hybrid controls. And then there are, there are a set that are customer owned, which have to do with more of your policies and procedures for how that you manage your staff and that sort of thing. So there's, there's a set that, that live on top of that at the top layer there. A lot of those um, you're gonna see um, you know, risk assessment, uh, uh, personnel and security management, those kinds of things. A lot of those are going to be things that you have to document because they're unique to your organization. So that's really kind of what you're gonna inherit from us in that model. So, okay, so now what I wanna do is change gears a little bit now that we've kind of talked about you know, what, you get, what you get from a compliance standpoint in GovCloud uh, to how that impacts your architecture and things that you're gonna wanna think about if you're migrating your application into GovCloud and you have to comply with some of these various um, uh, compliance uh, standards. So the first thing you wanna, you're gonna wanna think about is where are you starting from? Like where, if you're migrating into GovCloud, is this your first uh, foray into the cloud world? Or oftentimes, with, as particularly with SaaS vendors, we find a lot of them that have been selling SaaS commercially in our standard regions for oftentimes many years. So they actually have an application. It's running in AWS. It's running well. They're happy with it. But to, to increase their reach to these high compliance customers, they want to move into GovCloud. So they already have something. And oftentimes, well, well, sometimes, they actually will have already gone through FedRAMP at the moderate level in our standard region. So you may have that to start with. And if you have that, then a lot of that stuff is actually portable as you move into GovCloud. A lot of that documentation and uh, 
um, policies and procedures that you have will map pretty cleanly into it. You're going to have to do it again because you're going, doing it, at, especially if you're doing it at FedRAMP high versus a moderate, but it is a different physical infrastructure. So you're actually going to have to go read through the uh, accreditation process. Uh, the other, the other um, idea is, do you have, um, what exactly are you migrating? So you're going to want to think through, am I doing the full stack migration? I'm just going to pick it up and move it. Or am I doing a rebuild? We've worked with many customers who, okay, when I, re, when I actually redo this in GovCloud, I'm going to move over the data, but I'm actually going to rebuild the application from scratch in, in GovCloud. So if you do that, then you, know, you have a chance to make changes to your architecture. And you know, is it going to just be a lift, sh lift and shift, or are you actually going to make changes to optimize on cloud services? So those are some choices you've got to make right off the bat. So then once you do that, the, the next thing that we, uh, that we always do with customers, because this is, this is kind of a big deal to do early, sooner rather than later in the process. We want to do this early is we want to scrub your architecture with you and, and answer two questions. The first one being, do I have all of the services that I need resident in GovCloud? So the way GovCloud works is it's, a, it's an isolated region. Um, so when we deploy services to our platform, we typically deploy them to, you know, in the U.S., they usually go to U.S. East and U.S. West 2 in Oregon. Those are, you know, those are the big regions. They get them first. We kind of shake them out there. We let them bake a little bit. And then we move them into the special regions. You know, we, it's, it's, it's a staggered deployment. And because of that, you, won't, you will not see all of the services that you see in the commercial regions in GovCloud. Right now, there's uh, right around 60 services available in GovCloud today. There's north of 100 in the commercial regions. That number's going up this week, obviously, uh, because of all the announcements that we've made. But um, uh, you know, our goal and our philosophy around uh, parity when it comes to service parity in GovCloud is to, to do what we call pragmatic parity. So all of the services that are in the commercial regions don't necessarily make sense for GovCloud, but we move all the ones that are high customer demand in first. So we pri prioritize those in. So the first thing you so that's the first thing you want to do is make sure, do I have all the re services I need in region? And then the second thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to make sure that if the services you have are available, have they been through the, the right compliance uh, audits and accreditations, have we done that on our side yet so that you can use them? So, for example, if you wanted to use, we've had customers that want to use, uh, they want to move their databases off of a, off of a tradi traditional EC2 platform or even an RDS platform to Aurora. In the GovCloud region, we have not finished our accreditations for Aurora yet for FedRAMP High. So, if you wanted to do that and you ran it through a, a FedRAMP JAB audit, they would, they would reject that because the underlying services that you're consuming have, are not FedRAMP compliant. So that's the second part of the scrub you want to do, and you want to do that early so that if there are any adjustments you need to make, you make them early in the process, not later in the process. And when we, when we engage with customers, that is one of the first things that we typically do is to, to, to do that scrub. So then the second thing that we need to... Uh, to do with customers, and this, this generally is a big deal to get done early as well, is to actually define what it actually is that you're accrediting. And this is really important because it will definitely change the scope of your work depending on how you decide to do this. So you have to decide what's inside the boundary and what's outside the boundary. And we've worked with a lot of customers that get wrapped around the axle on trying to philosophically decide you know, what's in and what's out. So for example, your production environment that you're going to deploy, that's obviously inside the boundary. You're going to want that in there because that's, you know, primarily what you're accrediting. But there's a lot of things that live around it. So for example, you have development and test environments. So if I have dev, dev and test environments, do I want to include those in my accreditation boundary? Yes or no. Uh, you know, if you do, then the same audit controls that you place on your production environment now live on your development and test environment. You also have, most, most customers that we work with also have a set of systems that live around what they're selling as a SaaS product to help them manage and maintain that. So if you have ticketing systems, billing systems, CRM, that sort of thing. So if you have those systems, are they in or are they out? So you can make that decision. Then another category of, of systems to consider are things that are external to your product. You know, most most systems that get deployed today aren't standalone systems. They don't live just by themselves. They integrate with other things. And those external services, it's um, very important to understand how they're going to impact your architecture. Are they going to be included in your accreditation boundary? 
and um, how are you going to how are you going to handle that? So they could be as simple as things that are already in GovCloud. That would be the simplest case. But they also we do typically find a lot of customers that want to integrate with things that are in our standard regions too. And then we also get um, integrations to things that don't even live on Amazon. They either live in uh, their you know on-premise networks or they live in another cloud or you know, someplace else. A good example is, a typical one we get is if you have to do geo mapping type stuff. You know, we run into a lot of systems that have to do that and they map with, uh, they interface with uh, Google Maps or, you know, or an Esri system that they have outside. So, you know, is, how do you handle that? Is that, again, is that in or out? Then there's the end users and where they're coming from. Are they coming over the internet? Are they coming in from your customer's data center? Is it public? Is it private? Um, you have to consider whether, what, where are you going to draw that line around your system and say, this is what I'm accrediting and this is what I'm not accrediting. Now, fortunately, we've gotten some, uh, some guidance and some clarity on this from, from the FedRAMP Program Management Office, from the DOD, and uh, even, you know, it, we provide some of this guidance in our, user, our GovCloud user guide for ITAR compliance as well. So the, by and large, the, the rule of thumb when you're thinking about this is the boundary is determined by where you're processing sensitive data. Where you're, and where the sensitive data lives, that's inside the boundary. So for ITAR workloads, for example, I mean, from an Amazon perspective, we don't know what your data is. We, you know, we just, we're just providing you infrastructure. So we treat all of your data as ITAR restricted data. Then it's up to you to classify it and handle it properly. We give you guidance uh, at the end of my section. There are links to our Gov, there's a link to our GovCloud user guide. And um, in there, we go service by service and say, if you need to meet ITAR compliance, you can put ITAR controlled data here, you can't put it here. So um, we give you guidance on that. And with FedRAMP, they've actually also released a document which is, which is kind of helpful for this. Uh, the link is right there, and it provides boundary guidance. And um, one of the things they focus on first in that document, it's just a couple of pages, but um, anything is, you know, it's, it's coming at it from a pro, um, federal, you know, federal customer perspective. So it says, you know, if you're processing federal uh, data or metadata, uh, then you're inside the authorization boundary. So what that typically means is dev test systems outside. You know, if you're not putting any, if you're not putting any sensitive data in your dev test systems, if they're just using purely sample data, they're outside, and that's a good thing because then you don't have to worry about them from an accreditation standpoint. Similarly, with external systems. So if you have the, you know, the first category of systems I talked to were um, kind of your corporate systems, so ticketing, billing. Um, you know, CRM, that kind of thing. If they aren't processing sensitive customer data and they don't contribute in some way to the confidentiality, the integrity, or the availability of the system, typically you can leave those out too. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but you can typically leave those out. Um, if you are actually inter interfacing with a system, and Joe will talk about this in, in his section too, if you're interfacing with another system that already has a FedRAMP accreditation, you can actually reference that as part of your package so that that is, that is documented and understood by the auditor. So you, you'll want to do that. And then um, the last kind of piece of guidance I'd really provide here um, is that if you have external systems that you know, may or may not have sensitive data into them, a good thing to be able to do if possible is to make those interfaces um, configurable by the, end, by the end customer when they actually consume your, your SaaS system. So let's say, for example, they, your, your application interfaces with like a Dropbox type product, you know, where you can, you can put data in a Dropbox and take it out. In some, in some systems, depending on the data they have, it might be a heck no, we're not doing that. You know, we're, we're, just, we're just not doing that. And for other systems, because they know the nature of the application and what can be put in the, in the Dropbox type system, they might say, okay, yeah, that's okay. So um, you, it's good, a, a good way to handle this is to make those external systems interface is configurable. You turn them off, the customer can turn them on, the customer can turn them off based on their security requirements. So that, that definitely kind of helps um, in the whole uh, audit compliance audit process to, uh, to, to handle those kinds of situations where it's not totally clear what, whether the data would be sensitive or not. And then um, the last thing there is that end user and admin access is going to have to be very clearly documented. Um, you're definitely going to want to have encryption on most connections. You're going to be required to have encryption in transit. And for the, in particular for the admins, one of the things that you're going to want to do 
is you're going to want to have to make the boundary cleaner and you know, so you don't have to actually have the the administrators their workstations brought into the uh, boundary you want to have a very clean definition of how they access the system so typically we recommend having like jump box or bastion hosts or that sort of thing right on the edge of your boundary where anybody that's coming in to administer the system administer the system they have to come in through that interface you can clearly define the access controls the encryption that sort of thing and how they and how they gain access to the system otherwise if you're just coming in from if they're just logging straight in from their end user workstation then there's an argument that you have to pull that into your boundary which you really don't want to do So then, so, so based on that, so you can draw your kind of box around, this is what I'm accrediting. So then everything that's outside, you have connectivity issues too. And um, you're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna be very purposeful about how you document this. So, you know, if you're going to these external services, external systems, your end users, you know, what's the nature of that connectivity? Do I have VPNs? Am I using Direct Connect? Is it coming in straight over the internet? You know, that sort of thing. And um, again, some guidance from this from the, from, from both uh, our internal documentation as well as the FedRAMP PM, PMO. Um, for ITAR, basically if you're leaving the system, if you're, if you're leaving GovCloud, you know, and it's an ITAR workload, generally that data has to be encrypted. So even if you have a direct connect in place, um, we don't accredit, even in, in, in even if the destination of your, of your connection is, an, is another facility that's ITAR certified, um, we don't control what's in between. So the colo location that Direct Connect goes through, that's not. So that is not um, accredited. So generally what you have to do is you have to have a VPN in place, even if you're running Direct Connect, so that that data is encrypted from point to point. And then, you know, so it, it doesn't leave an ITAR uh, restricted boundary in an unencrypted fashion. So, and then, you know, just these connections in general do get a lot of scrutiny from authorizing officials and the auditors. They're really, you've got to be really purposeful about documenting the access controls for that system. What's the nature of the interface? What's the data that's flowing over it? Who has access to it? How is it encrypted? Is it a transient connection? And is, is it a, is it a, um, is it a dedicated pipe connection? Is it a VPN that's always in place? You have to be very purposeful about how you document this because they will, they will want to know exactly what data is flowing, how it's flowing, how it's encrypted, that sort of thing. And then two other, and then one other item that comes up with the connectivity is, uh, is in the federal government world are these two items here, these acronyms, the TIC and the CAP. TIC is Trusted Internet Connection and CAP is Cloud Access Point. Um, if you're not familiar with these two uh, acronyms, and you're, especially if you're deploying a SaaS product that you want to sell to, the, tell, sell to the federal government or the DOD, you're going to want to make sure that you understand these and if, the government has a, if, if your customer has a requirement for one of these because they can materially impact your architecture. Um, TIC is a, is a federal civilian government uh, creation, uh, originally by an OMB mandate. And the idea behind TIC was to Basically, both of these things were created in a, in a time before cloud. So they were, they're both perimeter security. You know, they're, they're basically gates at the border to, tr to capture traffic coming and going so that they can inspect it and make sure that there's no malware or you're not, doing, you're not leaking data and that sort of thing. Uh, they operate very similarly, but um, kind of at the core of both of them is this idea that traffic coming in and out of the customer's boundary needs to be inspected. So, but they were both built in a, in a time when there was no cloud. It was a very, I want to circle the wagons around my data center. I've got one or two data centers. It's a very defined boundary, and that's the way you know, I want to control it. In a cloud environment, you have a very distributed architecture. You're crossing many boundaries, and these can be a little more complicated to deal with. And we see um, two main architectures that, um, that, uh, that uh, we implemented to, to deal with this uh, Deal with this requirement. This is the first one, and, and in, this, in this scenario, we actually treat the the cloud infrastructure as an extension of the customer's network. So it's privately addressable. It's not directly accessible from the internet, and any traffic that's coming to or from the cloud infrastructure comes back in through the customer's network. And if it has to go out to the internet, or if there's traffic coming in from the internet, it's got to come in through the the trusted internet connection site. It gets filtered, it gets inspected, then it comes, you know, routes. Either way, it gets routed. And, um, you know, that's, this is one model that we see a lot. This can be a little problematic for a lot of SaaS providers who are, um, their stuff is natively available on the internet. So if you only have public 
IP addresses that you access this thing through, this is a little bit problematic because this is all private addressing. The other model is where the cloud is treated as an island. It's not part of the customer's network. It is a separate entity. It's all on its own and it's out there. And so what happens here is that traffic that's destined to or from the, um, the, the SaaS infrastructure platform comes through the tick, it gets inspected, and it gets routed on its way. So you just change your DNS to resolve to the, to the tick for that customer as opposed to, to, to the Amazon, your Amazon infrastructure edge. And then you can have VPNs, you can have SSL connections, whatever that you need to allow you to, um, to connect um, securely after coming through the tick. But the, the spirit of what they want to do here is they want to be able to see the traffic as it's coming and going. So if there is a need to inspect it, they can do that. So. So one of those two architectures is generally how we deal with it. And, you, and this is, like I said, this is, this is something that you're going to want to make sure that you get straight with your customer. Do they require this? Some, some will and some won't, depending on the nature of your data, what kind of an application it is, and you know, where the users are. They may, they may require this, they may not. But it's something that you want to get up, you want to get it way ahead of, because it could impact your architecture. And so, so that's kind, of, that's kind of it for me. The, the main things that, you know, that I covered really was scrub your architecture, figure out what your boundary is, figure out what your connectivity needs are. And those three things are going to, be, are going to carry a lot of the, those are the main trouble spots that we see customers have when they're trying to get their uh, application through the, the certification uh, hurdles and get, you know, get their accreditation done. So a few resources here. I mentioned the GovCloud user guide a couple times. This is, uh, particularly important for ITAR workloads. Uh, it has guidance on where you can put ITAR data and where you can't. Um, a couple of pages here, the, when I talked about scrubbing your architecture, the service compliance and the services by region. One will tell you what services are available in GovCloud. One will tell you which ones have been through. We do it by, um, by compliance uh, standard. So you have a FedRAMP. There's a FedRAMP page. There's a DOD page. There's a CGIS. You can just see them listed all across there. And then we have some other things around um, architecture requirements, uh, the, the quick start and the rec recommendations for FedRAM client compliance. These are architectures that we have known to pass. You know, these are good best practice architectures that have passed compliance audits. So they, you can use them to jumpstart your efforts. And so with that, I will hand it off to Joe. He's gonna tell you a little bit about what uh, his company has been up to. All right, thank you. All right. <clears throat> can you hear me? Great. Well, welcome. Switch over to me. I'm Joe Arthur. I'm a vice president of our government SAS. Uh, go into a little bit about Infor. So we're going to talk a little bit. About, so you've talked. If you look at a FedRAMP authorization or security authorization framework, and you look at AWS, that's about 25% of the controls that you're dealing with. So I'm going to talk about the controls above the hypervisor. So I'll give you a macro view of it first. Talk about some of the customer requirements that are driving it, which are the same requirements that they showed up there. So very synergistic here. Meeting the need, our perspective and our approach providing, providing this, but we'll give you a little bit of background on those first. And then why does it all matter? So let's go right into the macro level. Give you a little bit about Infor. We're the third largest enterprise business applica application company out there. We're privately held. Do about three billion revenue, 90,000 customers. Um, one important element which should resonate with a lot of you is our approach to this thing has been taking an industry approach. So we bought hundreds of business applications over the years and that dealt with specific industry requirements or functionality, manufacturing, um, healthcare manufacturing, public sector, aerospace and defense, retail a bunch of distribution, a bunch of different industry sets that we bought these applications under. And about six years ago, we made a decision to go all in with the cloud. We did an analysis, we chose AWS, we thought it was best suited. And we spent about $2 billion re-architecting our products. So it's not a lift and shift, we re-architected them for the internet, for the cloud. But we addressed three primary areas. One was the architecture to sit in the cloud. Two was a user experience. Same look and feel on any of our applications. Multi-factor, single sign-on across all of our applications. 
And then lastly, interoperability. We developed our own integration platform for integrating our hundreds of our own business applications. If you think about the different technologies that all came up with these applications, from a process integration, that was key. So when you look at our stuff and you're looking at your last mile functionality, it's not bolted on. It's built into it and it's, in, it's fully interoperable. You don't have to worry about that. Now, now with that said, we also looked at it from a security perspective. You know, if you think about all those industries being served and all the audits that you undergo, it's a significant amount. I think we do about 135 audits a year. So, so our approach was, as we looked at FedRAMP and we looked at the organization maturing, the government maturing on this thing, we used that as our baseline for our security controls. So now we can, with, with few exceptions, it is probably the lowest level of detail you're going to document. And so we grab that. There's a couple areas like FDA and other areas we go a little bit deeper. So we, we documented at the lowest level. And that's helped us significantly as we go through. Um, and so we've already talked about. The other thing is we did develop our own platform. So if you look at above the hypervisor, we've developed a platform that deals with our user access, info federated security, um, interoperability, um, as well as a number of other things built into this thing, so you don't have to worry about that. So from an overview, we talked about hypersensitivity and awareness to security across all these different industries. HIPAA being healthcare is one of those elements. FedRAMP, DOD, intelligence community, a number of those other things. That, um, talk about FedRAMP as a whole. Um, again, we settled on as the lowest common denominator from a FedRAMP from a NIST compliant viewpoint. But if you're in the federal government environment and you're in DOD or even the intelligence community, there are multiple levels within that. There's various impact levels for security and that go all the way up to secret, top secret, and so forth. So when we architected this thing, we looked at what was the most secure end we had to architect to, and we tried to select tools and services within AWS that we could leverage all the way up that, that Area. So we didn't have to buy a multitude of tools so we could use the staff and really optimize this. Because when you look at hundreds of applications in the cloud and you look at patching, fixes, upgrades, we do two major upgrades a year in our products. If you're not automating that, you're looking at a significant amount of workforce. Also, when you look at an architecture in this way, when you look at high availability, right, disaster recovery, with all those elements, having an RPO and an RTO times of 12 hours and one hour, you're not going to meet that requirement unless you've optimized those elements, including the security controls. So, um, some of the drivers are our own customer requirements. Again, this, I could have put the same slides up here that AWS had in all the different areas, but if you look, FedRAMP within in DOD, those were the primary drivers. Within the intelligence community, for any of you that operate within the intelligence community, they have another standard called ICD-503, uh, which goes into further detail. It, um, and then you have your healthcare requirements. Um, there's also financial, banking, IRS type elements. They're all of our, all the customers that AWS put up here are the same customers that we support today across our industry suites. Um, now meeting the need, what's our approach? We, we implement multiple layers, defense in depth, uh, in support uh, of safeguards and really protecting each link of the chain. We, um, from high availability, um, re resiliency, and so forth, it's all architected in the end. So if you ask how long did it take us to get through a FedRAMP authorization, I'll tell you, I've been in a company for four and a half years. It started when I came in the door. Um, and we spent the time up front understanding and looking at the impact from cloud 2.0, cloud 3.0. We looked at it holistically. And so when we actually started, it was about 20, it took us about 20 months from when we started to when we actually got our ATO. Most of that was remediating gaps, setting up our systems, testing it out, making sure automation, really getting our arms around it. When we actually got approved to go into the JAB process. So I don't know if you know much about the FedRAMP process, but you can do an agency authorization 
or you can do a JAB, which is a Joint Authorization Board author Authorization, which is General Services Administration, DOD, and Department of Homeland Security. They all go through an, your approval process. We chose that because you get that authorization, all agencies can leverage it. So build it once, authorize many times. Um, so we went through that process. And that process, from the time we were selected to when we know we were approved, was eight weeks. So I mean, we had our act together, and, and it took them four weeks to sign it. So, but it's, but we, st we still got there. Uh, we do leverage multiple AWS services, and they were right. We meet with you know, Keith every two weeks on where they are on AWS services in GovCloud for, is it in GovCloud and is it in, is it FedRAMP authorized? Because we realize, we use over 36 different AWS services today. Um, and, and a lot of it is the great services, their automation. Much like them, we do it all in the commercial cloud first. So as part of our overall framework as well as we put together a governance process so now we're governing the company as a whole because we make them advise us six months in advance that they're going to try to use another service. And is it going to impact the software that we have authorized? Because we need to start working that with AWS to get the service in GovCloud and work with the FedRAMP authorization office to add that service as part of our package. And the beauty of all this is you, in whatever other industry you're in, when we roll this thing out, you all benefit from it. So if you're in GovCloud and, you've, and you may not have the higher level security requirements, you're gonna benefit from the security framework and authorization that we put in place. So peace of mind, including ITAR. You may not have ITAR requirements, but no, if you do, just like AWS, we run it like everything's ITAR in there. So we have US persons and US soil only. So we follow the same criteria that you would want. And, and then we have an, a team of specialists that are dedicated to support this. Um, similar to a shared responsibility model that they showed, um, AWS is definitely the security of the cloud. They went through that in detail. You start looking at security in the cloud, our platforms, applications, our access management, how we architected that in order to leverage your identity access management solutions. So you don't have to change out your identity access management solution. We can leverage that and authenticate within our environment. Now, now we'll make sure you meet the FedRAMP requirements for that. And if you're a federal agency, you'd have to meet it anyways, because they're normally using a PIV card or a CAT card to go through it. Um, operating systems, firewall configuration, encryption on every end, including verifying that any inter connections that we have into systems you have meet the same security requirements so that we don't jeopardize our risk management framework. Um, and then on your end, really, you're, you're really responsible for your user access and management and your data management, including any of the ITAR requirements. It's really, we set the framework for you to operate within, but you've got to manage the access within that. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else on the slide. That that makes sense. That's probably it. Actually, I will go over one other thing. It's interesting for any of you out there that put out requests for quotes for SaaS services. Um, we know this is an evolving market, but a lot of times we see requests for quotes where you're prescriptive on how you want it. And we just kind of scratch our head when that, because if you're asking for a SaaS solution, your responsibility is user identity access management, data management, and then the comfort that we're running the SaaS properly for you. A number of times you put it out there and you're really asking for a hosting and you want us to put it in your environment and manage it. That's not a SaaS. So um, make sure you really understand what you're asking for and, and it will cost you more when you start looking at enterprise applications to have it host in your environment because we are honing these things um, and making them run very efficiently and driving the cost factor down. So just something to consider. And for example, meeting the needs. If you look at the infrastructure protection and operations management over and above what AWS does, you're looking at, we, we, you talked about the virtual private cloud, your stuff sits in there. We harden all our systems at the highest levels. 
um, and we manage and monitor that. Our IT service management system, we track everything, all the vulnerability scannings. And when you look at security, vulnerability, and remediations, anything that's critical and high, remediated within 30 days, um, moderate, 60 days, and, and even low, 180 days. Those are the benchmarks we're managing ourselves for vulnerability management. Um, from a secure remote access viewpoint, everything, no one's going to have a direct access. We, we, have multi, we have solutions for the tick that they brought up, and also we're working with um, DOD on um, the, the CAP access as well. So if you're in any of those areas, working with DISA on that. And then in the logging application, I'll go over the tools a little bit later, but we use Splunk as our aggregation for our security. Um, encryption, we encrypt everything at rest, you know, in transit, both ways, and um, let me go into the next thing. Also, from a testing viewpoint, we use, we have a DevSecOps approach. So it's all completely integrated into our software development lifecycle. We have multiple agile sprints. So we're constantly rolling changes. And when you have a true cloud application and environment, we're rolling in changes weekly bug fixes, patches, and so forth. And for the most part, we're doing two major releases. Now, when you think about enterprise business applications, financials, human capital management, um, logistics, distribution systems, you look at those types of elements with 8,500 customers in the cloud, 72 million users, that's a lot to be running through. We have a central quality assurance process that does the full regression test. So as we implement you and you have integrations, we take those integrations into account. We also certify from a FedRAMP perspective. We certify any integrations into our system and we'll look at it, one, to make sure it doesn't jeopardize security on our end or your end. Two, we'll also make it sure it's optimized so it's not gonna break when we do patches and upgrades. So that's when I talk about resilience um, in, our, in our solution set. So, so that's a lot to offer within it. We have our own code reviews. We talked about vulnerability testing. Uh, we have our own certified ethical hackers pounding away our system. And, and then we use independent third-party audits. And what's actually not showing on here is we have, when we went through the FedRAMP, we actually brought in a company, Kratos, to help us prepare, because they were, they were experts and we leveraged that. And then we selected Coal Fire as our 3PO, and they have done a phenomenal job Here's the tools we need, um, we use today uh, for our authorization. Uh, we did, on the commercial side, we, you know, not that we're not, we're using the best practices as well, but if you look, the Summa Logic is what we use for versus Splunk. Well, Summa Logic was not FedRAMP authorized, so we did have to change some tools when we went through the FedRAMP process, but we tried, we want to be common across all areas. Um, and then the rest of them there, including Burp Suite. So it's, these have been very effective tools for us. Um, the other thing we did is, because you're in an environment, U.S. persons in U.S. soil, and we are a global company. We've acquired multiple products all over the globe to meet industry-specific solutions. Uh, and we do have staff overseas. So in some cases, we need to hire people and bring them into the U.S. So we did a study and we selected West Virginia as a state to stand up our government operations. So Charleston, West Virginia. So um, we're, we've already got people hired in there today. Uh, we have a temporary office and the other office will be ready in six months. So we're expecting you know, 100 to 300 people there uh, as we grow out and build out this thing. A lot of incentives and reasons why we went there, including it's pretty easy to hire folks. Um, and then partnerships with universities. So universities are actually going to have in their curriculum f folks coming out of there trained in Infor products and solutions, uh, as well as they have a fast track for security clearances. So they not only graduate with experience in our products and solutions, they also get a security clearance. So it just, it, it was a right business decision to make and a great relationship with the state. Um, why does all this matter? Well, it's really about the customers and you. So I'll give you one example here, large intelligence agency. So, so if you look at this, the, the pendulum here, our first FedRAMP authorization, FedRAMP moderate, impact level two. We're also, 
implementing into the C2S cloud, top secret cloud, with the same software, same exact software. And that's the other thing I should probably comment on is when we re-architected this software, it's, if it's on-prem, hybrid, or in our cloud solution, it's the same code base. And even when we went through our security authorization, I was very clear, I want nothing different than our core code and promote to production. Obviously, there's different settings and different things that I take forward, but it's the same code base. And that's what makes it even more resilient. Um, and this customer here, they were behind on releases. Um, is it, this is a typical federal uh, contractor support model. They were behind on releases. When they did do things, it took a long time um, to put in place. They um, highly customized applications. There's a lot of times the systems integrators go in there and they'll, they'll want to build something. Um, and then lack of really self-service options. So they came to one of our conferences, saw the latest and greatest release of the product, and said, I want that. And so now we are moving them into the C2S cloud, and, um, and it's actually growing extremely well. So happy, if, you, if you're in that realm, happy to actually, uh, count, count exec right here that owns it is here. He's happy to talk to you more about it or what he can talk about it. But it's, it's a great success story. Um, state of Arizona, uh, another one, they, they on-prem, similar type um, scenario as, um, in, in both existing customers, by the way, um, similar scenario, and we're moving them to the cloud. They have, um, in fact, I'm going out there not too long ago, just to sit through, the, again, put them at ease on the security realm. It's one of the interesting elements as I go out there and talk to customers, and, you know, that this whole idea between, is it more... Is it secure in the cloud? So we got to walk through and actually put them at ease on why it should be, it is secure in the cloud. And then can they get copies of the scans and this and that? Well, when you're in a FedRAMP environment, our scans are actually given to the FedRAMP jab office. They review it. They're really doing that for you all. So it makes, there is a lot of savings on your end too, if you leverage something like that. Even if you're a government, if you're not federal, even if you're state local, if you're a government contract and needing to meet 800-171 requirements, you're going to meet it because there are 100 the 10, those 110 controls that you're required to meet are the same are within the FedRAMP 325 controls from a moderate viewpoint, 410 controls from the high perspective. So your requirements will be met either way. And I think that's really it for me. Okay, thank, thank you.